recording has started. All right. All right. I want to welcome everyone to Hebrew Institute Live on this beautiful Sabbath day. The weather here is absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. You know, outside I'm here watching the robins and everything in the trees. And it just reminds me a, a tree. I'm right here before a tree. And it takes me back to you know where, okay, back to Eden, which actually is going to be our title today. Our title today is going to be back to Eden because that's where we're going back to uh, uh, today. Um, it's a good day, I have to say. Uh, I have boxes all around me, guys, okay? Uh, so, you know, I'm busy, busy packing. Still don't have a place yet, but busy, busy packing. I know God is going to bring it through. When I when I leave here today, I saw someplace that really, really piqued my interest. So I'm going to do a drive-by to see if I like the neighborhood. And if I like the neighborhood, then I'm going to contact them, you know, because this house has, it's a four-bedroom house. And one of the bedrooms has a separate entrance in it. And I've already claimed that as the office, <laughs> okay, <laughs> as the office already. So uh, we shall see if it's big enough, you know, uh, uh, it'll not only be the office, but I think I'll bring our printer back, okay, bring our printer yeah, back yeah. and everything so that we can, you know, start doing some things there. And I'm looking at it, already planning, and it's like, if I can get in and get everything done right, then maybe we can have Passover over there. Speaking of Passover, okay, Purim is next week. Remember, Purim is on the 6th of March. Passover is a month later. So I'm preparing right now, and I have to say, usually by now we have our, our Passover you know, preparations done. I know where we're going to be and everything. This year, I think we're going to do it on Zoom. Okay, we're going to have to do everything on Zoom because right now I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure, you know, uh, uh, whether I will have the facilities to be able to bring everyone over. So I would rather everyone plan to be on uh, Zoom, all right, be on Zoom and everything so that you can start planning now. And then if we switch, okay, if we switch to being in, in person and uh, possible, I might have a few people over, we'll be able to have guests, you know, I will see. I will know more probably by the 15th of March. Okay, so if my place is large enough and everything, you know, uh, uh, maybe I can have the Tampa Bay people, you know, over like we did uh, last year, you know, just a few people over, maybe about 10 or so over, and we'll do it there. Otherwise, you know, let's plan to be on Zoom. This way, that takes a lot of anxiety from me, okay, at this point, you know, planning that. I will send out the satyrs. The satyrs are going to be the same ones as we have always, okay, always used. So if you still have that printed out, good, because those are the ones that we are going to use. I don't even think I have to change any dates or anything with that. I'll look at it real quick. But if you do, just scratch out last year's date and put this year's date in it. No sense in, in killing a whole bunch of trees, you know, for this. You know, uh, uh, big thing is uh, I see fist bumping going on over there. You know, uh, so, uh, but anyway, it must be a couple's thing. Itchy, where are you? You can be my fist bump. We do a paw bump or something like that. You know, uh, he, he's in his little room. As soon as he sees me putting on my clothes, he gets up out of his bed and he goes to his room because he knows I'm usually leaving the house going bye-bye. He knows that's the sign for bye-bye. Okay, so uh, uh, anyway, he's in his little room listening and everything. So it looks like... Uh, we basically have everybody who's going to be speaking online. Uh, Grace is uh, actually doing a, a training for her massage therapy. I'm kind of excited about the training she's doing. Maybe next week I'll have her, okay, uh, talk about it because it's something that just falls in line to what it is that we are going to be doing. Guys, once again, I want us to plan on trying to go over to Sierra Leone next year, okay, uh, this Next year in October, I'll say October, you know, around the feast days, around tabernacles or so, you know, uh, I will probably need to go over the end of this year because I have a lot of things that need to be tied up with helping babies breathe because all of our equipment did not come in time for our um, uh, for our outreach. So I've got to deal, you know, kind of deal with that. So I'm kind of planning to go back. 
you know, to go back then, God willing, you know, uh, uh, to go back. And so I'm kind of excited about a lot of the things that I see going on. This lesson today was very insightful for me. And let me say something. If you are studying Torah and you don't feel more, I'll say, not just empowered. Torah does empower us, but it also instills a sense of responsibility when you fully understand what this Torah is about. And this week's lesson and next week's lesson are going to be very, very insightful for us because it really, really instills a sense of responsibility, accountability, but understanding about, wow, God, this is what you did for us. This is what our responsibility is. And once you understand that responsibility, I'm getting chills, you understand the empowerment that he has given us. Because we didn't learn these things in church. We didn't learn them because they didn't know. Okay, now, and the reason they didn't know, listen, the reason they didn't know is because it was purposely kept from them. And when I say purposely kept, when the church decided to divorce itself from the Hebraic roots, you lost the foundation. And anything not on a secure foundation is going to have problems in the end. So in some cases, you know, it's like if we have the Holy Spirit, the holy purpose of the Holy Spirit, that's the spirit of God. That's the same spirit of he who said, let there be light that dwells in us. And that same spirit of let there be light is the same one in Genesis 1 that set the foundations of our faith in order. And once we understand that, it should bring us to an awareness of where it is we are, what our responsibility is, who our God is. There's no way that if you can understand Torah, that you can stay where you are. I'm sorry, you can't, you just can't, okay? Even if you are in Torah, okay, Friday night, when you hear something that hits your spirit, you know you will not be in the same space at 3 p.m. on Sabbath day as you were 6 p.m. Friday night. And we've been in this thing for over 20 years. I was thinking about that. Somebody sent me a question saying uh, there was a problem with the Torah portion. Okay, that I didn't have the correct Torah portion. And I looked and it's like, it's the correct Torah portion. Okay, I get it right from the JPS to not. And it's like, it's the same Torah portion that we've been using for 20 years. So if you've been with us that long and just noticed it, either you have not been paying attention. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you have not been paying attention. But a lot of times I ask people, where is your source? Okay, what is the source of what it is you believe? And let me ask you something. You know, that's a question that you need to ask your church friends. What is your source of what it is you believe? And what are they going to tell you? Your, my source is the Bible, right? Isn't that what they're going to tell you? And that if they say we have an, an, an Ed and if, if Cindy was here and Renee, you know, we were always told we have the original apostles doctrine that was drilled into us from the day that we were baptized in Jesus name. We have the original apostles doctrine. And if we have the original apostles doctrine, when they say that to you, turn right to Acts chapter 15 where it says that we were supposed to be in the synagogue on the Sabbath day where Moses is read, and then turn to Luke chapter 24, where it says Yeshua taught them all, taught the apostles, the disciples, all things concerning him, beginning at Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. That is the original apostles doctrine. And if you are not on that original apostles doctrine, I ask you, what is the foundation for what it is you are believing right now and the actions you are taking right now? And a lot of times people can't answer it. 
okay? They can't answer it, okay? Because just because you're Bible-based, let me tell you something. I can throw a chicken bouillon cube, okay, in some water, all right? That makes it chicken flavored, but that don't make it chicken soup because there ain't no chicken in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so you can be Christian flavored, okay, you know, and one of those commercials, he gets us, let me tell you something, come revelation, he gonna get us, okay, you not fight with Torah, he gonna get you, you are so right, okay, People don't know what they're saying, okay? And as far as us being part of that woke generation, yes, I was blind, but now I can see, <laughs> okay? I can see. So if that makes me woke, meaning I am awake and I am aware of what is going on, okay? Because think about it. If you aren't woke, you are asleep, okay? If you aren't woke, you could possibly be dead, <laughs> okay? You could possibly be dead, all right? So all trying to impose that anti-woke doctrine, okay, are dead. They're either dead or they are asleep, okay? Because the meaning of woke means I am awake, I am aware of my circumstances, and I can act accordingly, you understand what I'm saying with that? We woke up one day and next thing you know, we're saying Baruch Hashem, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Marcia Austin, please give us one of your powerful, powerful prayers. And let's let's go with our, our schedule here. Connie, I think Ed told you you're reading the article. Okay. Very good. All right. Marcia, if you're, I don't know if she has to work, if she can uh, unmute. Marcia, if you can unmute yourself. All right. I don't know if she's having uh, any difficulties. All right. I'll tell you what, Ed, unmute yourself. All right, and go ahead and uh, open us up in prayer. And then if Marcia is available, she can come out. Lord God, we thank you, Father God, for once again bringing us safely, Father, to another Torah study, Father. We thank you for this lesson you're about to give us today. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for opening our hearts and our eyes and our ears to hear. Father God, that we may receive according to Moses, the prophets, and the Son. Bless the past and the virtues you're about to bring today. As always, Father, we pray for peace. Peace in your holy city of Jerusalem. Peace, Lord, in the diaspora. Father, and peace in the world. We pray, Lord, that the Prince of Peace comes to deliver us with peace. We pray always, Father, for healing for all those who are sick and shut in. We thank you, Lord, for a breakthrough, Lord, in your word. We thank you, Lord, for a breakthrough, Lord, in the application of your word. We thank you, Father, that we go forth to take your tour to the nations as you have instructed us to do. We thank you, Father, you bless us as we, we do, and we pray as always according to Jeremiah 29. Empower us here, Lord, to build houses, to plant gardens, to eat the fruit thereof, to marry and give our sons and daughters in the, marry, in the marriage, and prosper and grow here that we might not be diminished. And pray for the peace of the city where I've caused you to be scattered. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you, Father, for the word we're about to see. Now, Lord, we gather together to meet you as we do on a weekly basis. And we thank you, Father, that you're always sure to show up and show out. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this word we're about to see today. Bless the pastor to bring us your teaching and your instruction. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Okay, this is Boise from North Carolina. I will be reading Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Now on the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which Yahweh pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity 
that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he was on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there is there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve them to the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moshe was admonished of Elohim when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, says, says he, that thou makest all things according unto the pattern showed to, to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So by so long, Hermine. All right, you're muted. Shabbat shalom. There you go. This is. Oh, okay. Shabbat shalom. This is Hermine from St. Petersburg, and I'll be reading from the Messianic Jewish Family Bible, uh, and I'll be reading nine uh, Hebrews nine, uh, one through. Uh, I just <laughs> was looking at it. Um, one through six. There we go. Okay. Now even the first one had regulations for worship at the earthly sanctuary, for a tent was prepared. In the outer part were the menorah, the table, and the presentation of the bread. This is called the holy place. Beyond the second curtain was his dwelling called the holy of holies. It held a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant, completely covered with gold, in the ark, it, no, gold. In the ark was a golden jar holding the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it, cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But it is not now possible to speak in detail about these things. Now these things prepared this way, the Kohanim, do continually enter into the outer tent while completing the services. Oh, I think I went over. Okay, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. Shabbat shalom. This is Katrina from North Carolina, reading Hebrews 9, um, 23 to 24. Hebrews 9, 23. It was therefore necessary the pattern of things in heaven should be purified. And these that but heavenly things themselves, which were better sacrificed than these. For Hamashiach is not entered into the holy place, made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself now to appear is the presence of Elohim for us. Shabbat Shalom. Sis? Hey, Shabbat Shalom. This is Renee from North Carolina. And I'll be reading from 1 Kings, beginning at the fifth chapter, um, verse 26, and then up to chapter 6, up until verse 13. Yahweh had given Solomon wisdom, as he had promised him. There was friendship between Haram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. King Solomon imposed forced labor on all Israel. The levy came to 30,000 men. He sent them to the Lebanon in ships of 10,000 a month. They would spend one month in the Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was charged, was in charge of the forced labor. Solomon also had 70,000 porters and 80,000 couriers in the hill, apart from Solomon's 3,300 officials who were in charge of the work and supervised the gangs doing the work. The king ordered huge blocks of choice stone to be quarried so that the foundations of the house might be laid with hewn stone. Solomon's masons, Hiram's masons, and the men of Gabal shaped them. Thus, the timber and the stones for building the house were made ready. Chapter 6. 
And the 480th year after the Israelites left the land of Egypt in the month of Ziv, that is the second month, in the fourth year of his reign over Israel, Solomon began to build the house of Yahweh. The house which King Solomon built for Yahweh was six cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. The portico in front of the great hall of the house was 20 cubits long along the width of the house and 10 cubits deep to the front of the house. He made windows for the house. He made windows for the house, recessed, and laid it. Against the outside wall of the house, the outside walls of the house enclosing the great hall and the shrine, he built a stone structure, and he made side chambers all around. The lower story was three cubits wide, the middle one six cubits wide, and the third seven cubits wide, for he had provided recesses around the outside of the house so as not to penetrate the walls of the house. When the house was built, only furnished stones, no, sorry, only finished stones cut at the quarry were used, so that no hammer or axe or any iron tool was heard in the house while it was being built. The entrance to the middle story of the side chamber was on the right side of the house, and winding stairs led up to the middle chambers and from the middle chambers to the third story. When he finished building the house, he paneled the house with beams and planks of cedar. He built the storage structure against the entire house, each story five cubits high, so that it encased the house with tempers of cedar. Then the word of Yahweh came to Solomon. With regard to this house you are building, if you follow my laws and observe my rules and faithfully keep my commandments, I will fulfill for you the promise that I gave to your father David. I will abide among the children of Israel and I will never forsake my people Israel. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Signs, wonders, and miracles are released by my spirit. In these last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. My Holy Spirit will give dreams and visions to your sons and daughters. All my servants will prophesy. I will show you signs and wonders in the heavens above and on the earth. Many will call on my name and be saved. I have many different kinds of gifts for my servants, but my Holy Spirit is the one who distributes them to you. To some, he gives a message of wisdom, to another, a message of knowledge, and to another, great faith. Some will receive gifts of healing, miraculous powers, and prophecy from my spirit. Others will be able to use great discernment or will have my gifts of speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues. All my gifts are the work of my Holy Spirit. Earnestly desire my Spirit's giftings for you. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit and count us worthy to be filled with the power to perform signs, wonders, and miracles in your name. Your power will confound and defeat all the powers of darkness and will cause many to desire your salvation. Your power is awesome and mighty to overcome all the works of the devil. Amen. You will overcome the devil by the blood of my son. Just as the blood of a lamb sprinkled on the doorposts in Egypt by my chosen people established a covenant of blood with me and protected them from the destruction that I brought to those who had enslaved them, so too have I established a covenant of blood with you. Through the blood of my dear son Yeshua, which covers you, I have redeemed you from the curse of sin and have adopted you as my own dear child. I have equipped you with everything good for doing my will, and I will work in you to, to cause you to do what is pleasing to me. Through the blood of Christ, you can have confidence to come into my presence. In his blood, I, will, I have given you redemption, forgiveness of sins, and have redeemed you from the power of evil. We have eternal redemption through the power of the blood of Christ. We have been raised to new life in Christ so that we may serve the living God. We overcome the devil through the blood of Yeshua. Through him, we are made perfect and have the confidence to enter into the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom, 
Uh, this is Lena. I'll be reading Portion Summary in This Week in, Bi in Bible History. Portion Summary. The 19th reading from the Torah is named Teruma. In Exodus 25, verse 2, the Lord commanded Moses to tell the sons of Israel to take a contribution for me. The word translated as contribution is Teruma which is the name of this Torah portion. Teruma is a word with no real English equivalent. In the Torah, Teruma refers to a certain type of offering dedicated to the temple, like a little, like a tithe or first fruit offering. In Exodus 25, the contribution is for the building of a holy place. This Torah this Torah reading is occupied with the instructions for the building of the tabernacle and its furnishings. This week in Bible history, Hasmonean holiday, Shavet 28, 2nd century BCE. On Shavet 28, 134 BCE, question. Antiochus V abandoned his siege of Jerusalem and his plans for the city's destruction. This day was observed as a holiday in the Hasmonean times, the Gilad Tanit. Columbia tragedy, tragedy. Israel, Israeli astronaut parishes, Shavet 29, 2003. On the morning of February 1st, 2003, the Colombian space shuttle returning from its STS-107 mission was destroyed upon re-entry 16 minutes before its scheduled landing. All its crew members perished, including Ilan Ramon, a co combat pilot in the Israeli Air Force, who was the first Israeli astronaut. Prior to his departing to space on Space Shuttle Columbia, where his mission included the manning of a multi spectral camera for recording Desert Arozo, he arranged to take kosher food as well as a Kiddush cup, a Torah scroll, and a dollar from the Lubavitcher Rebbe of righteous memory. Plague of Darkness, Adar 1, 1313 BCE. The ninth plague to strike the Egyptians for their refusal to release the children of Israel from slavery. A thick darkness that blanketed the land so that no man saw his fellow and no man could move from his place. Exodus 10, 23. Commence on the first of Adar, six weeks before the Exodus. Second Temple completed, Adar 3, 349 BCE. The joyous de dedication of the second, the, excuse me, the second Holy Temple, Bet HaMikadesh, on the site of the first temple in Jerusalem was celebrated on the third of Adar of the year 3412 from creation, 349 BCE, after four years of work. The first temple, built by King Solomon in 833 BCE, was destroyed by the Babylonians in 423 BCE. At that time, the prophet Jeremiah prophesied. Thus says the Lord, after 70 years for Babylon will I visit you and return you to this place. In 371, the Persian Emperor Cyrus permitted the Jews to return to Judah and rebuild the temple, but the construction was halted the next year when the Sumerians persuaded Cyrus to withdraw permission. Aga for Horus II of foreign fame upheld the moratorium. Only in 353, exactly 70 years after the destruction, that the building of the temple resumed under Darius II. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Inter interesting fact.
Does anyone know what time it is? Jewish time is comprised not of days, but of months, <clears throat> each possessing a distinct spiritual essence. The special days of the year are simply days on which the particular months quality is more pronounced and actualized. Thus, Nisan is the month of liberation. While Passover observed in Nisan 15 and 22, is a week long period in Nisan during which the month's freedom quality is more accessible. Similarly, Savan is the month of wisdom, Shavat is the month of growth and fruitfulness, Elu is the month of compassion, and so on. Each month has days in which the month's quality rises to the surface and manifests itself more than on the month's ordinary days, but these differences of expressions. Rather than essence, essentially each day of the month equally possesses the month's unique spiritual properties. This is why many of the festivals and special dates at the Jewish calendar occurred on the 15th of the month. The night of the full moon representing the point of which the month's essence in its most revealed and illuminous state, three. Adar is the month of transformation. Adar transforms sorrow into joy, doubt into super knowledge, Oblivion into exuberant being. Adar transforms a scattered people into unified nations and a moment of national weakness. When the Jewish people participated in Ahasuerus' feast and the belief of allegiance to a mortal king which ensured their survival, into the greatest statement of Jewish commitment of all times, when the entire year, every single Jew remained faithful to his or her people and God, even as a decree of annihilation hung overhead of every Jew in the world. Adar transforms the most physical activities, eating and drinking, into affirmation of our bond with God. So while two days in Adar, the 14th and the 15th of the month, are reserved as Purim, these represent the apex of an entire month of joyous transformation and transformative joy. Finally, here is the inspiring kish, kish, shek, what? Hasik. <laughs> Finally, here is the inspiring Hasik thought we promised. A month of Jewish calendar includes either 29 or 30 days, reflecting the 29.5 day lunar cycle. But every two, three years, seven times in a 19 year cycle to be exact, Adar doubles in size. On these pregnant years, as they are called, there are a 30 day Adar, I followed, I followed by a 29 day Adar too. Oh, I'm sorry. After double the size of these pregnant years, as they are called, there's 30 days Adar one, followed by 29-day Adar 2. In addition, 30th of Shabbat is also the first Adar is Rosh Hadash, head of the month, days, head of the month. Days, this makes for a total 60 Adar days. Luba Victor Rebbe points out that the number 60 represents the potter, power of transformation. A rule of thumb in Torah law is the nullified by 60 principles. For example, if a piece of non-kosher food accidentally falls into a pot of kosher food, the undesirable element is nullified if the desirable element is 60 times greater than it. Thus, the Rebbe includes, concludes, in a year blessed with a double 60-day Adar, all undesirable elements, every and any cause for pain, sadness, discouragement, or dejection are nullified and stimulated by the transformative joy of Adar. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Parashat Tarumah. Tarumah, the attitude of the heart. Parashat Turat focuses on building the symbolic core of the Israelites the tabernacle or the Mishkan, which will become the central shrine and sacred symbol of God's dwelling amidst the people. The Mishkan will be a physical entity, but it will spiritually link the Israelites into a nation through God's divine presence. The portable structure is considered the forerunner of the temple built in Jerusalem, many generations after the wilderness experience. 
The building of the mishtarim of forced Israelites to work together in order to fulfill a common goal and prepare for a common future. Although they have just been given the Decalogue, the precepts that bind Israelites to God and one another, the people's participation in making of the tabernacle will unify the nation in a different way. It will elevate the seemingly mundane work of construction into a sacred vocation dedicated to the service of the one God who freed them from Egypt and revealed the terms of the covenant. Let us pause for just a minute here and reflect upon a slave people now free voluntarily building the Mishkan, God's dwelling place on earth among his people. Let us briefly recall their last building project back in Exodus chapter one, when there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, who decided to deal shrewdly with them because they grew great and mighty. Remember this is found in Exodus 1, 11. Therefore they, the Egyptians, set taskmasters over them to afflict them with burdens and they built for Pharaoh, supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. So their last construction project was in slavery. It was a project under harsh taskmasters in which they built uh, treasure cities for Pharaoh. According to Parashat Terumah, the Israelites women and men alike provided not only labor, but also the raw materials for the Mishkan. So everyone participated. Their gifts brought as a voluntary offering are gathered and transformed into a place for God to reside in their midst. Imagine how these former slaves felt as they became both builders of a nation and builders of a dwelling place for the divine. Imagine that from slavery to Pharaoh to building a divine dwelling place from God and forming a nation. God instructs Moses, tell the Israelite people to bring me gifts. You should let yourself gifts from me from every person whose heart is so moved, 25.2. This kind of giving, a free will offering, does not come through guilt, coercion, or competition, but from the deepest recesses of the soul. The Israelites bring yarn, precious metals, cloth, tan skins, an array of earth objects that will eventually become the sacred place where Israel can see God's presence. This earthly dwelling place for God is very important when considering the fact that Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, the dwelling place that God had created for man in Genesis 2 and 8. The Lord God planted the garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man whom he formed. In today's parish show, man is given a chance to perform what is called in Hebrew tikkun olam, literally a repairing of the world, or in this case, a repairing of the breach caused by Adam's transgression. The parish show begins, tell the Israelite people to bring me gifts. The Torah then adds, you shall accept gifts from me from every person whose heart so moves him, or other translations say, who wholeheartedly want to give. In other words, it's totally voluntary. The root word vid ye nu is nadav, or Strong's H5068, or means to offer freely or to volunteer. A literal translation of the phrase in Exodus 25, one might yield from every person according to the volunteering of his heart or according to the generous nature of his heart. The act of giving must be accompanied by a volunteering heart, a heart that is reaching out to serve the other. We can understand the phrase volunteering heart to mean one who invests their time and energy in trying to understand and relate to other person or people in need. When we act toward others with generosity of spirit, we create a place in our lives, which is a mishkan, a place where God dwells within us. When we help each other, we create a mishkan, a dwelling place for God. Do you think that it is important to God that we invest our time and energy in trying to understand and relate to the needs of others? Are we truly sons and daughters of the Most High? Does he understand our needs? Apparently, God does not want gifts from just anyone. The materials that are to be used to create the Mishkan or the tabernacle to build a place of holiness must come from those who give their gifts from their own free will. These gifts must be, to use a term from the realm of psychotherapy, ones that are freely given. Exodus 25, 2. Speak to the children of Israel that they take an offering from me, from everyone whose heart makes them willing, you shall take my offering. This offering is called terumah, which is not easily, which is not an easy word to translate. It does not have a good English or Greek equivalent. It means gift, offerings, presents, contribution 
tax, sacrifice. The word comes from the root rum, which means to lift up, raise up. It has to do with something that is lifted up in order to be set apart from the rest. The same word is used to describe the offering that was given to the priest from the fruit of the ground before the tithe was given. In this case, however, it is not the same thing. We can understand the word as a consecrated portion that is raised up as an offering for sacred use. In fact, Cheruma has two separate roots that mean both separate and elevate. So in the word Cheruma, we have the emphasis being on separating and elevating. Giving a contribution is simply giving. But when God says, take unto me Cheruma, the one doing Cheruma is elevated to a higher level with God. Tithing is obligatory, but the giving of the offering is voluntary except those required for Yahweh's set times. Therefore, only those with a glad heart can give to this building project. This way, the tabernacle was an extension of the people's heart in which Yahweh wants to dwell. As it is written in 2 Corinthians 9 and 7, that each man give according as he has determined in the heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 6, 6 to 18, it is written, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Even as God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says Yahweh. Touch not the unclean thing. I will receive you. I will be your father and you will be to me sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Are we sons and daughters of the most high? Do we separate ourselves by observing the Sabbath? Do we keep the feast days, the appointed times? Do we observe the dietary laws? Do we distinguish clean from unclean, holy from profane? Do we walk according to his teachers' instructions? Do we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony? Yes, we are indeed sons and daughters of our father, the Lord Almighty. Exodus 25, three. This is the offering which you should take from them, gold, silver, and brass gold, silver, and copper. The metals are listed in descending order of their value. This in turn is determined their use for various objects, furnishing the tabernacle and its parts. The closer the object is to the Holy of Holies, the more valuable the metal of which it is made. Iron is notably absent because of its utilization for most efficient weapons of death, made it incompatible with the spiritual ends that the secular was intended to serve. Nahum Sarna, that's the JPS Torah commentary on Exodus. The first thing that Yahweh asks for is gold, and it is most precious. According to Genesis 2.12, gold is good. The Torah of Yahweh declares gold to be good. Gold has value because the Torah gives it value. Here, willing hearts have an opportunity to give the most valuable thing to Yahweh. This is the reason that the children of Israel were asked for precious objects before they left Egypt. Their riches were necessary in order to complete this building project unto Yahweh. Here we see that the offering of the word of, the word of Yahweh was not taken in secret. How then shall we understand Yeshua's word in Matthew 6, 1 through 4, where it is written, be careful that you do not do your charitable giving before men to be seen by them, else you have no reward from your father who is in heaven. Therefore, when you do merciful deeds, don't sound the shofar before yourself, as hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may get glory from men. Most assuredly, I tell you that you've received your reward, but when you do merciful deeds, don't let your left hand know what your right hand does, so that your merciful deeds may be in secret. Then your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Hallelujah. Amen. First of all, we have to understand the word charitable given in this passage in Hebrew. It is the word zedekah which means righteousness, justification, merit, good deeds, alms. The term Zedekiah is often used as describing help for the needy, especially the financially needy. This is what Yeshua is talking about here. What he's talking, what he's saying is that when it's a question of helping a person in need, it is forbidden to talk to others about how much one gives. There are two reasons for this. One of them is in order not to be praised by men. The other is so that the one who is in need is not shamed. To shame someone is a form of murder. Yeshua therefore forbids his disciples to show how much they give when they help the poor. 
This prohibition, however, concerns only zadokah, offerings of charity, not other kinds of offering. There are many examples in scripture of public collection. The scripture cannot contradict itself. In this case, it was not a matter of zadokah, helping the needy, but terumah, an offering toward a sacred purpose. This type of offering must not be secret. Naturally, it is the attitude of the heart that matters most to Yahweh in order for the offering to be pleasing to him. We learn this by what happened with the offering that Cain and Abel gave in Genesis 4. Not all offerings, therefore, must be secret, only Zadokah, charity to the needy. Turumah, the attitude of the heart, Shabbat Shalom. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Good, very good lesson. Okay, I uh, um, wanted to keep in mind something that uh, Lena read about the um, rebuilding of the second temple, the finishing of the temple, second temple. Just keep that in mind for a minute because uh, um, I'm going to come back to that after my lesson because I want you to see a pattern. Okay, a pattern. All right, one thing to know about Teruma offering, a Teruma offering. Okay, and one thing you need to understand when you make that offering, okay, your offering creates a place where the presence of God can dwell. I want you to think about that. Okay, based upon what we are learning in this particular Torah portion, what was the purpose? Always remember, what is the purpose established? What is the purpose of that offering? What was the purpose of bringing all of that gold out of Egypt? It wasn't for you to put in your bank, your 401k or your stock market investments, okay? It was for one purpose. And what was that? The building of a place where the presence of God could dwell in our midst. Now, based upon the attitude of your heart, you will either create a place where the presence of God can dwell, or you'll create, we'll see next week, what? A golden calf, okay? Where your image, okay, your Im a place where your image of God can dwell, okay? Your perception of what God means can dwell. But just remember, your offering, when you think about that, and I, I advise you to write that down so that you can think about that. Your offering creates a place where the presence of God can dwell. And wherever you see the presence of God, what are you going to see? Miracles. You're going to see marvelous things, okay, happen where the presence of God is. Okay, so um, I'm going to go over just a, a tad touch of next week's lesson also, okay, because next week's lesson talks to us about Sabbath and the prohib prohibition of work. So what is work? What is work? All right. In Hebrew, the word work is melakha, melakha. And what is melakha? It is the process of deciding with your mind what you want and then acting to make it so. So it is the process of deciding with your mind what you want and then acting to make it so. All right, trust me when I say, okay, when I do something, before I do something, I think about it, okay, and then implement it. It may take me days and people may think, why is she doing such and such? No, I have to get it formed in my mind first. And then once I form it all in the steps in my mind, I simply implement. And that is one reason why people don't understand why a lot of times we can move as quickly as we do. Because first, the entire plan is formed in the mind, and then it is implemented. See, too many people get an idea, then they try to implement it. It doesn't work out. So what do they have to do? Go back to the drawing board again and keep going back and forth. No. Once that plan gets in my mind on how to do certain things, then I begin to implement it, and boom, okay, it gets done in an orderly fashion. That's how exactly how. I'm actually doing the moving with this house, okay, right now, because, uh, you know, it's just Isaiah and I right now moving this whole entire house. And the plan that I have 
everything is getting packed in an orderly fashion. Okay. And not stressing out because, you know, with certain limitations that I have right now, I can't be doing things 12 hours a day, the way that I used to, you know, be able to get them done. So I have to have things in order. It is no difference. That's why I say the one thing Torah should teach you is order, how to put things in order. And that's why I keep on referring us back to Eden, back to Genesis chapter one, because the plan of God was in God's mind first, and then he began to put things in their proper order. So work, once again, is the process of deciding with your mind what you want, and then acting to make it so. Now, a couple of things to understand. Man adapts his environment okay, to suit his desire. So you can adapt your environment. In other words, you go in and arrange a room how you like it. You understand? Someone else may have a room design. That's just like when you go into a model home, okay, and you decide to buy that home, you don't recreate the same thing from that model home. You put everything where you want it. You understand what I'm saying? Everything where you want it. So we adapt our environment to suit our desire. However, there's something else that we can do. We not only can adapt our environment, but we can create an environment also. We do that. Guys, come on now. Or ladies, you ever want to create a romantic evening? What do you do? You go out and get all those candles and you know, uh, take a visit to Victoria's Secrets, ladies, okay? <laughs> because you are creating that environment, okay? We can create, not only adapt, but we can create an environment also. And that is what makes us a lot of times godlike, okay? And what is that? The ability, okay, to do what God did. Remember, God created us in his image. And this is why it's so important that we keep going back to Genesis and getting uh, Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. Okay, for example, we stay in those, okay, because that is the foundation for our understanding of everything. God created us in his image. So if you really don't understand Genesis chapter one, you are not going to understand what your purpose is a lot of times and how God made us in order for us to have the fullness of what it is God is teaching us in Torah. So this week, okay, we begin in Exodus chapter 25. First thing he asked for is an offering. First thing, the offering. And then it goes into the Ark of the Covenant. So that's where we're going to spend a lot of time because the one thing with the Ark of the Covenant that really, really impressed me was how the Ark was created. And when I went to Israel, I'll never forget, I'm sitting next to Brother Wolf and I'm at Temple Institute. We were at Temple Institute and they brought out not only the pictures, but the ark that they were creating. And they had pictures of it. And the first thing I noticed about the ark was the two angels, the cherubim that were on the ark. They clearly had different hair styles. One was more male and one was more female. I looked at that and I jumped up. Okay, I remember I jumped up out of my seat and I asked the presenter, where did you get that design? Because God had been dealing with me that everything he created, he created male and female, male and female. So when I'm looking at these cherubim, okay, on the ark that was created by, okay, the Temple Institute, I'm clearly seeing that. Where did, and I asked them, where did you get that image? Okay, and the guy, the guy said that was the image that God had given us. Okay, God gave us that image, okay, to do that. And it was just like, I looked at Brother Wolf. Okay, he was trying not to look at me, but I looked at Brother Wolf because we had been talking about that. That was around the time when I was just about, I had just become, I think it was, yeah, I had just become ordained, as a matter of fact, I had just become ordained, and God had revealed to me in his kingdom, 
okay? In order for the kingdom to be productive, the kingdom follows a creation model and it's male and female, male and female, okay? Everything he created, male and female. I didn't understand the fullness of what God was revealing to me until I came into Torah, okay? And understood how he created, why he created and everything. So it's important that as we are looking at the tabernacle, we've actually got to go back to Eden. We've actually got to go back to the beginning because if God is has created us in his image, in the image of God created he them, male and female created he them, everything that is getting ready to go on is following a basic pattern that God made starting in Genesis 1 all the way to Genesis 3. And I was focusing on those cherubim. So let's talk about the cherubim. Where do we see the cherubim, okay, in this week's Torah portion and next week's Torah portion? Number one, we see the cherubim where on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, they were commanded to make that out of one piece of gold. I'm still trying to figure out only the supernatural could have taken that and just taken one big piece of gold and formed, okay, that cover, okay, that cover with it. You had to be endued, okay, by God, okay, in order to do that, imbued, I'm sorry, by God in order to do that. So we see the angels and it's important, the cherubim, and we talked about cherubim actually on Thursday night. We were talking about the cherubim when God, you know, lifts up off of the uh, 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 temple back in Exodus, not Exodus, Ezekiel chapter nine. Remember, we were in Ezekiel chapter nine, Ezekiel chapter 10, and we were talking about the cherubim and the wheel within the wheel and all of that. Okay, from Thursday, get Thursday service if you need it. Okay. And so uh, um, anyway, um, so the Ark of the, the, the Covenant, and yes, you're getting ahead of, uh, getting ahead of the lesson, so just stop and listen, all right, so we have the Ark of the Covenant, okay, that's where, once again, they cover the caparet or the covering. Another place that we see the angels is on the veil, which separates the Holy of Holies and from the rest of the tabernacle. So that's where we see another set of angels, okay, or cherubim, I can just call them cherubim. Okay, third place that we're going to see these are the curtains that form the roof of the tabernacle, okay? And that roof of the tabernacle, they drape over from the roof to the sides of the wall. So three places that we are looking at cherubim, okay? So now remember, Moses was given a heavenly pattern. It is so important to understand the pattern that Moses was given, all right? And get that in your mind so that everything that we are reading and looking at is based upon a principle on earth, finish it for me, as it is in heaven, on earth earth as it is in heaven. All right. So we remember that why Moses was given the design of the tabernacle based upon a heavenly pattern. And we saw that in our reading in Hebrews that Moses was given a heavenly pattern. So now let's get into a little bit of meat here. Remember, man was created in the image of God and what do we know about the tabernacle? The tabernacle is what? A form of man's creation. The pattern was given by God, but who made the tabernacle? It was the Israelites. And what did they use? They used the materials, okay, that they had been given, the gold, the silver, the blue, the linen, and all that kind of stuff. So it was a form of creation, and remember, man made in the image of God is given that power of creation, all right? Just like, okay, man is made in the image of God, God gives him the power of creation. God created the universe, okay? And what was the purpose of God creating the universe? 
Okay, did God need to create the universe? No, he was God all by himself. Did he need to put the laws of gravity in place and, and physics and all that kind of stuff, the Big Bang Theory and all that? Did God need that? Let me ask you something. Before the universe was created, did anything exist? Yes, God did. Okay, God existed. He didn't need any of that for his existence, but who's, and you can unmute yourselves, okay? So we have a little interactive. So if God created the universe, God was not creating these things for himself to exist. Who was he creating them for to exist? His children, us. For us, oh, us. Katrina, you said something very profound. His children. Oh, hallelujah. So I want you to think about this. His creating all of this and then the last thing to be created, okay, is like the world becomes a place of creation. And the final act of that creation, of course, is Sabbath. But right before that, we have what? The creation of man. So that everything that is being done is creating an environment where man can exist and thrive. And then man is given birth to- All right, somebody, oh, you got some background uh, noise. So just be careful of that. Okay, so anyway, uh, um, so where else do we see an environment where that is created for the benefit of man to exist. I want you to think about this. In the natural, where do we see, okay, an environment that is strictly created for one purpose, and that is the creation of man? You can unmute yourself if you get it. In the, in the garden. In the garden. Back in the garden. When a woman becomes pregnant. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. You got it, Lena. The womb. The, the womb. womb. Okay. okay. The womb. Okay. And when a, a child, okay, when a woman, so, okay, used to be, all right, today it may not be so much so, but the purpose of having that child is to create an environment that will produce an object of your love. Okay, yes, and of your love, okay. And so man, once again, was created in the image of God. And the tabernacle is a form of his creation, just like the universe was created by God to provide a the universe was created by God to provide a place for man to dwell in the midst of God. Remember, God was God all by himself. So when he creates the earth, okay, and he places man in it, God's creation, once again, was to provide a place for man to dwell in the midst of God. Now, the tabernacle, on the other hand, was made by or created by man to create a place where God could dwell in the midst of man. Do you see some similarities, okay, going on here? God first creating a place where man can dwell in his midst, the tabernacle, a place created by man where God could dwell in his midst. Okay, the whole thing is, is that both were places where God could dwell with man. First time God created it, second time we created it. The world that was created by God as a place where man can be, all right? So the world was created as a place by God, okay, where man can be. The tabernacle was created by man as a place where God can be, all right? Now, the very act or work of creation was an act 
of love. I love Christ because he first loved me. I love God because he first loved me. Think about that. Think about, and nobody, nobody thinks of Genesis chapter one and two as an act of love. God, as an act of love, creating as an act of love for man. We are just so in our, you know, just rope, okay? Just you know, wearing blinders, all we can see. Is the scripture, but we don't understand the reason why. Okay, so now understand the work of creation was an act of love. Why did we create the tabernacle? It was an act of love. How do we know that? It was an a, a pure act of love. Okay, Exodus 25 tells us, go to the people, ask them, anyone that has a willing heart, to give an offering, to give an offering. So if you love God, okay, what are you going to do? It's not going to be grievous you giving an offering to build a place where God could dwell. I mean, out of gratitude, I was a slave. Just a couple of months ago, we were slaves getting our heads kicked in by Pharaoh. And now here we are. And God is telling us, he has us around this mountain and he's so excited. He looks at us and says, you are my peculiar treasure. I want to be with you. I want a place that I can dwell with you. Okay. Do you not think that God missed being able to dwell with man the way he did in the garden? All right. Yes, of course he did. All right. And so once again, he has us to create a place, to create a place where he can dwell with us. All right. So let's go. Why does God give us laws? Because we don't understand that because we got a lot of laws. We got a lot. This week is a lot of instructions. And next week, instructions on the building of the tabernacle, along with some laws, like we have the laws of Shabbat and all of that. So why does God give us laws? If we do not understand the purpose of that, all we think of is law, 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 you know? And when we think of law like that, something in us just wants to rebel. The speed sign says speed limit 45. I'm going to go 50. Okay, <laughs> we're going to press it. Okay, so when uh, you go 55 and the policeman pulls you over because it's only 45, don't get mad at him. Okay, there are laws. Why did God give us laws? Okay, God does not need laws, okay, to exist in this world. He didn't need them. He is the law giver. We are the ones who need them. Laws are necessary for us to live in our world. You understand what I'm saying? Laws are necessary for us to live in our world. All right. Laws instituted by God at creation were designed to govern the processes that we needed in this world to survive. Remember what I say, science is simply man catching up to what God has always known. Do you think that the law of gravity was created when supposedly that apple fell and hit Newton on his head? Okay, <laughs> gravity was long before that. Gravity is something that we need in order to exist in this world. If there was no gravity, like there is not any gravity on the moon, we'd be floating all over the place. So why do we have laws once again? Laws are necessary for us to live in our world. We have laws of gravity, laws of physics, okay? Scientific laws. And science, once again, is simply man catching up to what God has already known and put in place. God also gave us specific laws that we need to abide by. And we find out later on in our Torah portions, those laws are like clean and unclean, knowing how to separate holy from common, okay? And so by obeying all of those types of laws that God gives us, we do what? Our obedience to those laws 
We begin to create a space where God can abide with us the way that God created a space in the garden originally where we could abide with him. It's all about back to Eden. Everything we read is about taking us back to Eden. Now, the tabernacle was intended to be the place, once again, that we make for God in this world, all right? Very important to understand. The tabernacle was intended to be the place that we make for God in this world. Why? Because we once had a place in this world that was made for us by God for us to dwell with him. What was the name of that place, guys? The Garden of Eden, right? The Garden of Eden. So where are we once again? Back to Eden. We're constantly going back to Eden. Remember, God's, okay, Eden was God's garden in our world. Eden was God's garden in our world. Let's look at some scriptures that refer to it as God's garden. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Okay. In Ezekiel chapter 28, let's look at verse number 13. Ezekiel chapter 28. Woohoo. Verse number 13. You were in Eden, the garden of God, the garden of God. Doesn't say the garden of Adam. It was not Adam's garden. It was a garden created by God that he placed man in. So garden of God referred to there. Let's go to chapter 31, Ezekiel chapter 31. Okay. And let's look at verse number eight and nine. Verse number eight, cedars in the what? Verse number eight and nine, Ezekiel 31, verse number eight and nine, cedars in the garden of God could not compare with it. Cypresses could not match its bough and plane trees could not vie with its branches. No tree where? In the garden of God. Once again, was its peer in beauty. So we see here, the Bible refers to Eden as God's garden, very important to God's garden. Okay, now what was the purpose of man in that garden? Let's go to Genesis chapter two. We can go to Genesis chapter two. My poor Bible here is falling apart. Okay, and Genesis chapter two, let's go to verse number, fifteen. Genesis chapter two, verse number fifteen. Man's whole purpose in the garden of God, the garden that he created and placed man in. Now, when you have a garden, you make a garden for what? It's a place where you want to be. It's a special place to you, okay? So we see in the Bible, God walking in this garden. This was a garden of God, a place he created for himself and he placed man in it. What was the purpose of that? Yahweh Elohim took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To till it and tend it. So God was placed man in the garden as a worker. He placed him in the garden to dress it. It might say dress it and keep it. That word dress is Strong's number H. I think it is 5647. All right, that means to till it, till it, to tend it, and then to keep it. Strong's number H8104, that means to guard or protect it. 
Hello. You don't know what the purpose of it is. So man's responsibility was to tend the garden by tilling it and protecting what was in it also. All right. God, we have not done so great a job on this earth. When we look at all the animals that have been, that you created, that we have caused to go into extinction. When you look at how we have ruined this earth, ruined the air, defiled it, who's going to answer for that? One day we will. Okay, one day we will. Okay, and remember, okay, in Genesis, let's go. Genesis chapter 3, 8. Let's go a little further. Genesis 3, 8. What do we see? They heard the sound of Adonai Yahweh walk moving in the garden at the breezy time of day. Okay, so they hear the voice of God. God comes down to his garden. All right. He comes to pay us a visit in the garden. We're supposed to be tending and keeping it. We're supposed to be grateful. Okay, to God. God is our father, right? All right. When he put us in the garden, we were naked and unashamed. And uh, Katrina, you were so right. We were children. You ever see children? Children will get naked in a heartbeat. Okay. They don't feel encumbered by clothes. They want to be free. No baby feels ashamed because they don't have clothes on. A little three-year-old, they'll take off their clothes in a heartbeat. You'll have to be running. They'll be running down the street butt naked if you would just let them because they have no shame. Do you know shame is something we teach our children? I want you to think about it. Aren't you ashamed? Put on your clothes. Aren't you ashamed? That child had no shame. We teach our children shame, okay? And that goes back where? Back to Eden to the garden, where when we became ashamed of our nakedness and put on clothes, okay? In our innocence, we were what? Running around with no clothes on, okay? Just like that three-year-old running around with no clothes on. So, all right? So God, okay, is walking in the garden. The voice of, the, of God walking in the garden. What are we now doing? We're hiding. Instead of coming out and being with God, God didn't walk in the garden. And when he put us in there, he didn't put a wardrobe. He didn't send us with a credit card to Macy's saying, pick out all the outfits that you need. No, God knew we were naked in the garden when he came to visit us. Okay, he put us in the garden naked. He knew what our condition was. It was through sin and our shame. Next thing you know, we're hiding in the garden trying to make clothes. Don't even know what clothes are. Picking up leaves, trying to make clothes. Did not no pattern, no nothing. Okay, trying to make clothes. Okay, we no longer now understand something. We hid do what? To our sin of disobedience and eating the forbidden fruit. Now, next thing you know, we no longer have access to the garden of God. Genesis chapter three, we get kicked out. One thing to understand, this is a principle, okay, that you need to understand. When you violate the laws that govern a place, and this is a good one to write down. When you violate the laws that govern a place, you no longer have rights or privileges, okay, that that place offers. So remember, when you violate the laws that govern a place, you no longer have rights or privileges that that place offers. Can we relate to that? Can you relate to that on your job? You violate certain laws on your job. Guess what? You get fired. You will get fired, okay? So if you violate laws, you no longer have rights or privileges that that place offers. Need to think about that. That was a big sila moment taking me from here all the way through everything that is going on right now, whether it is going on in our country, whether it is going on spiritually, whether it is going on in the physical, okay? When you apply that law, you can say, uh-oh, Houston, we've got a problem, 
okay? We really do have a problem because how many laws have we, how many laws of God have we violated, all right? So we need to understand that next thing you know, we're kicked out of the garden. We no longer have access to it. And what do we encounter? Our first encounter with what? Cherubim. Only we have two cherubim and what are they doing? They aren't there with their arms, wings open. Okay, welcoming us back. No, they're standing with swords that would destroy us if we tried to come back. That's a frightening thing. All right, very frightening thing. Your first experience with something is something that stays with you. You understand what I'm saying? If you get, okay, go to a dog and that dog attacks you, every dog after that, you usually are afraid of. That's why people are afraid of dogs. Okay, a lot of times that dog acted, one dog may have acted hostily to them when they were a child. Here they are an adult and they are still afraid of dogs. That's like my lawn guy is afraid of itchy. He doesn't like dogs. It's like he's just a little dog. Doesn't matter. He won't bite you. He had an experience with the dog. And here he is almost 80 years old and he still does not like dogs, afraid of dogs. So that first experience, okay, with cherubim, is a hostile one, cherubim about to kill us, to drive us away from the only home that we have known. So what is your impression of cherubim from now on? They're frightening. They're a place, they're not a place where I can go to be with God, okay, anymore. All right, so now, once again, what was the purpose of the cherubim? It was to separate us from something. Remember the cherubim separated us from the garden so that we would no longer have access. As a matter of fact, when we go back to Genesis chapter one, we get the first instances of creation where there is separation made by God. All right, there are separations made by God. That's why if I, I say, if you don't understand original creation, you're not really going to understand how the Mishkan or the tabernacle or temple even was created. So we have similar separations in the tabernacle. What do we have separations in the tabernacle? We have a veil. We have curtains. And we have the covering of the ark. And what is on each of those? Cherubim. Only this time, once again, the cherubim do not have flaming swords. Their wings are doing what? Welcoming us. Okay, now. Remember that we talked about separation, okay? So that veil, the curtains, the covering of the ark, okay? The curtains do what? Separate from the rest of the world, okay? The veil separates the holy of holies from the rest of the tabernacle. And what does the covering over the ark do? It separates from what is inside. So we have three levels of separation there, all right? Now we talk about the tabernacle is as a creation, okay? Creation by man, man made in the image of God. So if man is made in the image of God and we've given the power to create a dwelling place for God on earth, do you think maybe part of that pattern would be part of the Genesis pattern also, okay? So I'm looking for separations, three separations from different things. I'm looking for similar instances, similar patterns. And so we have what? What were the separations in creation? Separations in creation were what? Light from darkness, light from darkness. 
another separation, big separation, okay? The waters above from the waters below. Remember, those created the atmosphere, okay, for us to be able to breathe. Remember, everything God is creating in Genesis 1 is for our benefit to create a place where we can dwell in his mist, okay? The third creation, okay, or rather separation was what? Day from night, day from night. And what did that create? It creates time. Day from night creates time. This is where we get our days, our months, and our years, okay? Days, months, and years. And what are they separating? Uh, through All throughout cycles of what? Darkness and light, darkness and light. Day and night, darkness and light, all right? So the tabernacle has three separations. Creation has three separations. However, in creation, we actually have a fourth separation. And that fourth separation was the cherubim when they separated us out of the garden. That was not God's original design and intent, all right? So he separated us up out with those cherubim, with those flaming swords to prohibit us access to the garden. However, now, out of love, when we're building the tabernacle, giving our voluntary offering to create a space where God can dwell in our midst. Those cherubim are not pro prohibiting us from the access to God. They are actually bringing us back, welcoming, welcoming us back to the presence of God, to the place where we were always supposed to be in the presence of God, okay? It was a, a place when we were with God, a place where time and space did not matter at all. We were with him. And I want you to think about this, okay? Why do you think the veil was rent? The veil was a separation, separating us from the holy of holies. God, Yeshua, in restoring us back. When, okay, when we go, I tell you what, let's go to a couple of, uh, and we saw this, okay, in Hebrews. Let's go to Matthew. Let's get it from the New Testament. Let's look at this, the veil being rent. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And Matthew chapter 27, let's look at verse number 51. Matthew 27, verse number 51. And we see, okay, Yeshua died and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Okay, graves were open, guess what? People were separated from what? Death. Oh, glory. Come on now. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, my Lord. Hallelujah. Let's go to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Verse number 45. In verse number 45, we read again. The sun was darkened. Light from dark. Okay, separation. The sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. Okay, rent in the mist. All right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ephesians, let's go to Ephesians, second chapter. I love Ephesians. I don't care what anybody says, Paul is all right with me. Ephesians, second chapter. Uh, 
Uh, let's start at verse number 11. I wasn't going to start there, but I, I, I like these verses here. Okay, verse number 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcised by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. At that time, okay, you were without Christ. Remember, verse number 12 is the definition of a Gentile. You were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the co covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. When we were Gentiles, we were pagan, confused, and without God. But now, in Yeshua HaMashiach, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Mashiach, for he is our peace who have made both one and have done what? Broken down the middle wall of partition between us, separation. What was that veil once again? Separating us from the mercy seat. Hallelujah. Through Christ, we are no longer. The tabernacle once again was a pattern, a pattern. How did God fulfill it? How did Christ fulfill it? It all goes back to Eden. He's bringing us back to Eden where we remember the tabernacle and the temple were supposed to be like Eden, a place where we would dwell with God and God would dwell in our midst. Only what happened through sin, there had to be separation in Eden. Through sin, there had to be separation in the tabernacle and in the temple. But through Christ who became what? The payment for our sin. He restores us back to that original condition in Eden where there is no longer a separation, a wall of separation where there are cherubim trying to kill us with flaming swords the cherubim are now what welcoming us us saying come back home we're being welcomed back home to god again continue reading in ephesians 6 15 rather 2 verse 15 having abolished in his flesh the enmity of the torah of commandments contained in ordinances he didn't end the torah he fulfilled us by showing us this is the reason why I had to do all of this. Now I no longer, it doesn't mean you don't have to do it. You need to understand why I had to do these things because I was taking you back to the place where God originally ordained for you to be. His original intent was to dwell with you, to create a place where you could dwell with him and where he could be in your midst. That's why our bodies are the temple of Lord. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why in Torah, we create an environment where we are pure, where we are holy, where the spirit of God can dwell in our midst and the power of God within us to others he goes on to say contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man where are we back back in the garden where he is making us over again becoming that adam who will dwell with god in the garden according to god's original design and intent making what shalom Shalom. Let, let me see. Where do I have to keep on? Oh, verse 18. Let's continue. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. That is what? Those naturally born and those who would what? Come to him through what? Ephesians second chapter that we just read. One. We are one. Do you understand what I'm saying? Paul says we are one. There is no difference between Jew and Greek. That's why I told you in the beginning of this, you need to ask people why they believe what it is that they believe. Because if we are one, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. All are one in Christ. Okay, so that's why I tell you, ask them why you are not one. Okay, with this, he says one body by the cross having slain that enmity. What was the enmity? The hatred for the Torah. So how are you going to come to Christ through his blood and still hate the Torah? 
Hello. Okay. And then he goes and came and preached shalom to you, which were afar off and to them that were nigh. So the same Christ preached to us who were far from God and those who were close to God. Same God, one God, making us one body. For through him, we both have access by the one spirit unto the Father, which is why you need to understand Okay, Romans chapter 11. Let's go back to Romans chapter 11. Come on, Paul. You're on fire today, Paul. Okay. Romans chapter 11. Let's go to verse number 13. Why? Because we're back in Eden, right? And if you are back in Eden, you cannot have a conversation about Eden unless you're talking about two trees. Come on. Hello. Unless you're talking about a tree. Okay, verse, uh, verse number 13, Romans chapter 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. He's so humble. Paul <laughs> is so humble, okay? <laughs> if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Oh, yes, God has given us the power to raise the dead. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. What is the root? Torah is the root. Torah is the root. What did Yeshua say? You are the branches. We are the branches. So if he is the root and he is holy, we attached to him are holy. And if some of the branches be broken off and thou being a wild olive branch were grafted in, wait a minute here. So if some of the branches from the original tree be broken off, Oh, you didn't hear what I said. He didn't strip the original tree of branches. He only broke off some of them. Hello. So that means the Jews, all the Jews were not displaced and replaced. Hello. Some of the branches were broken off. And us being a wild olive tree, we're grafted in. Oh, hello. We were on a completely separate tree. And we were grafted into the original tree. Torah is called what? The tree of life. Yeshua is who? The Torah made flesh. He is the truth, the way, and the life. Come on. He is the tree. So we were grafted among them and with them that partakes the root and fatness of the olive tree. This is why you are in the synagogue on the Sabbath day where Moses is read because as a grafted in, this is how we partake of the root and the fatness of the original olive tree. Come on now. Boast not against the branches, but if thou bearest, not the root, but the root thee. So come on, you wild olive tree. Okay, wild olive tree thinks the Jews have to come after them. It ain't that way according to what Paul says. You better break yourself off and find a, find a synagogue to get grafted in. Find a tree to get grafted in. Okay, he goes on to say, well, thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Woo, glory. The only way I got grafted in was because some of the branches were broken off. Why were they broken off? Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but you better fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. 
Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but towards thee, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise you also shall be cut off. Oh, so you grafted in, but remember, remember, you can be broken off too. Why were they broken off? Because of unbelief. Unbelief. You have to believe in that tree. It's all about the tree in the garden. We're back to Eden again. It's all about the trees in the garden. Okay. So if this tree that we're grafted in is the tree of life, what is the wild olive tree that we were taken from? The tree of what? With the fruit of what? The knowledge of good and evil. Greek mindset, knowledge of good and evil. Hebrew mindset, tree of life, tree of life. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. So if we're grafted into the olive tree that is rooted in Christ, if the Jews were the natural olive tree and the root is Christ, it always was about Yeshua because there is only one God. Which is why John in Revelation, when he rolls up on him, he says, I am the Aleph Tav, Alpha and Omega. I am the first and the last. I am he that was alive, was dead, and is alive again. I am he. Come on. So it was always about Yeshua, the word made flesh. It was always about in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and all things were created by him and nothing that was created was created without him. And that same word became flesh. So it Yeshua always was the root. He always was the root. We were out there pagan confused and without God. But one day we were sitting in church and something told us to get up and get out. And next thing you know, we are grafted in. And what are we doing? Here we are getting ready for Purim. Here we are getting ready for Passover. Here we are getting ready for Shavuot. Here we are getting ready for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Tabernacles. We didn't think about those things. But when you start partaking, when you are grafted in and you begin receiving that nourishment from the root of that original tree, you begin to bear that fruit from that tree. You understand what I'm saying? So this is why we are where we are right now. Now, once again, there was a wild olive tree. There was a natural olive tree. Both were olives, understand, which means both had wild olive tree, his form of worship, natural olive tree, his form of worship. But we know the natural olive tree is the one that was rooted in Christ, which is why we're in the synagogue on the Sabbath day where Moses is read. And the other olive tree was rooted in whatever. Okay, why they have a completely different set of laws. A completely different set of laws. Now, I want to go over something. When I talk to you about the, okay, about the uh, uh, Lena's reading that I was looking at. We talked about the cherubim. We talked about the exile from the garden, right? Everything is a pattern. Have you noticed that? Everything that uh, all the way from Genesis to uh, Genesis through all the Torah, De Deuteronomy, we keep on going back. We keep on going back to the garden. Even now in Romans, okay, and Ephesians, what do we do? We still wind up back in the garden. Okay, we get to the book of Revelation. Where are we? We still wind up back in the garden. 
Okay, it's always pointing towards back to Eden. Everything is pointed towards back to Eden. God reveals the end from the beginning. So if you don't understand the beginning, you're not going to clearly understand the end. So when Melina read that, all of a sudden, boop, light went off. And here I am off in, in, in Never Never Land again, looking at something. So Genesis chapter three, we have exile from the garden. We have the angels chasing us out, right? But next thing we have is the tabernacle which is what? Tabernacle is our once again creating a dwelling place where once again, the presence of God can dwell with us. Okay? Then we enter into the land. All right? We enter into the land and what do we do? We build a temple. We build a temple. And that temple becomes the place where the presence of God dwells in our midst in the place that God chose to leave his name, okay? So he's there with us, okay, again. But what winds up happening, all right? Originally, we were in the garden, then we get exiled from the garden. We create the table, ta tabernacle, tabernacle, and then the temple. But what winds up happening? Because of our disobedience, what winds up happening? Boom, there we do get exiled from the land again. We get exiled again. Good scriptures for this. First Kings chapter 11, get a chance to read it. You will see the exile of the Northern kingdom, first Kings chapter 11. And then you can go to first Kings chapter 25, where you can complete Judah. So you see the full exile. So here we are with the temple, temple representing what? Here we are, garden that we made again, but through sin, we get exiled again. Does that sound familiar? Is this sound beginning to sound like a familiar pattern? Then comes Lena's reading, which triggered all of this. I went to 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 22, where it talks about how Cyrus ordered the rebuilding of the temple. What was the purpose of the temple? Once again, to build a place where the presence of God could dwell in our midst. And then that temple was completed in 349 BCE, which was probably uh, close to about, say 350 years before the birth of Christ. But we did not see the fire come from heaven the way we did with the first temple, okay, to know the presence of God dwelling in our midst. We don't see the presence of God dwelling in our midst in the second temple until Yeshua rolls up in it. Remember, the temple was meant to be God's home here on earth. Yeshua kind of explains that to us when he says, Birds have their nests, foxes have their holes, but the son of man has no place. Why? Because his place was where? His home was the temple. His home, okay, as the most high is the temple. His home as king would have been a castle. But at that point in time, the Davidic kingdom was not sitting on the throne again. So either way, remember Herod was calling himself king of the Jews at that point. So Yeshua had no home either as king or as the almighty. Because remember, what were they doing? They were taking the word of God and making it to no effect. They were doing their own thing. The oral traditions were overplacing the written traditions. So he was not even welcome in his own home. Even when he stood up, we see him stand up in tabernacles. We see him stand up in Hanukkah, okay? And what happens? He winds up getting tossed out. We see him in the book of Revelation, okay? It's the church of Laodicea, knocking on the door, trying to get in because they changed the locks. They didn't even give him a key. Okay. If you got to, if you, if that's your house, you're supposed to have a key. 
Now, even if there was a lockbox on it with the key in it, they could have at least given him the code, <laughs> okay? But he didn't have a key. He didn't have a code. And what does he say? If you will let me in. That means nine times out of 10, you're not getting let in, in your own house. This is where we are right now, okay? Where Yeshua is not worth, is not even welcome in his own house. We have a Yeshua that is made after our own image so that we could follow our own laws. He says, do this, but we're going to do that. He says, love our neighbor. Okay, take care of orphans, widows, and strangers. But what are we going to do? Oh, we're not going to do that. We're going to do our own thing. Come on. And we call ourselves a Christian nation, not understanding that what we did to others, we were doing unto Christ. If you beat your slave, if you hung your slave, if you murdered your slave, you were doing it unto Christ. And this is why people don't want. Okay, the history taught, because one day you will wake up and find out, wait a minute, this was not very Christian. But let me tell you something. Oh, don't think you're stopping with Black history, my friends. One day, somebody going to wake up and read the Bible. And next thing you know, the Bible is going to be exiled because the Bible is supposed to, its purpose is to what? Try to make you feel bad about your sin so that you can change. And when you're in an environment where people say, oh, we don't want any, any history that's going to make anybody feel bad about anything. The next thing you know, the Bible is not going to be welcome either because the Bible sure is going to reveal to you your sin. The Bible is sure going to reveal to you your history and the things that you did that were contrary to God. No if, ands, or buts. So this is not, don't ever fool yourself to think it is only about Black history, okay? It is about history. It is about his story. It's about his story. And they just go in this particular way. Why? Because the serpent was the most subtle of the beast in the garden. Remember, Pharaoh used subtlety to enslave his people, God's people, once again. Are we there yet? We sure are. Come on, we sure are. And where in the world are the real prophets of God? Too busy being for P-R-O-F-I-T and not as a P-R-O-P-H-E-T of the Most High God. Come on now. So we see all of that. We see that pattern. But wait a minute. The second temple was completed in 349. But what winds up happening in 70 AD? We get exiled again. Exiled from the garden. Exiled from the first temple. Exiled from the second temple. All of them have something in common. When we decided to define good and evil in our own image in our own image, which is exactly what they did in 70 AD. They crucified Christ. They had to find good and evil based upon what? Their traditions of man. So here we come once again. We say 1948, we're allowed to go back into the land again, even though it is a land that was given to us by the United Nations. It's not the fullness of the covenant given to us by Okay, by in the covenant, the land grant given to Abraham, but we'll take it. Okay, we'll take it anyway. But guess what we're about to do? If you're following Israel, if you are following what is going on with Israel, I'm telling everybody, you better get ready again because we are headed for another exile. Don't have to believe me. Just read the book of, Je of Zechariah as to what happens in the end times, okay, with Israel once again. Same pattern until Yeshua comes back and reconciles all things once and for all, okay? So here we have this pattern once again that began where? Back in Eden of a place where we could dwell with God, God could dwell with us. 
the first one created by him through creation. We messed that up. Second time created by us so he could dwell with us. Messed that up. Third time created another place, okay, where he could dwell with us. Messed that up, okay? So what is the likelihood we're going to mess it up again? Come on. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So that is all that I have for you guys today. Okay, I hope you got something out of it. Marcia, are you able to unmute yourself? She must be working. Okay. Um, I tell you what, Renee, Renee, why don't you pray us out? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this word that has gone forth. Your heart has always been to return us back to you. The word today, Father, that the woman of the Most High, our leader, our shepherd, has brought forth, Father, is that you always wanted us to return us back to Eden. Father, as in the beginning, as it is in the end, your loving teaching and instructions were always to bring us back to you. We pray this word has gone forth, Father, over the airways and the hearts and the minds of everyone that has heard it, Father, to bring us back to you in repentance, in humility, in love, in forgiveness, Father, in obedience to your loving teaching and instructions for us. Father, through you being our Yeshua HaMashiach, our Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Father, the veil, the separation that caused us to be apart from you, Father, it was rent in two. You want us to come directly to you, Father, in love, in repentance, in obedience, Father, to obey your loving teaching and instructions, your commandments, Father, which are life, which are hope, which is peace, which is our healing, which is our joy. Father, thank you. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Father, for being who you are in our lives. Father, we pray for those who are sick, who are shut in, those who are suffering, Father, and feel like they have no hope. You are their hope. You are our hope. You are our healer. You are our deliverer. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Remind them of your love. Remind them, Father, of you joining us together as one people with one mind and one heart. Father, thank you for hearing us today. Thank you for answering. Father, be glorified. Be glorified, Heavenly Father. Show yourself mighty on the behalf of your people who are crying out to you, Father. Answer quickly from your sanctuary. Answer quickly, Father, when we call. Hasten, Father, to the cry of your people, Heavenly Father. Meet every need according to your riches in glory. Father, we praise you and we honor you this day. In your name, I Savior, our strength, our Redeemer, our hope, our future, our the very breath that we breathe, our Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, the Word made flesh. Be esteemed, Father. In the mighty name of Yeshua, do we humbly pray and thank you. Amen and amen.